So good evening, everybody, and a very, very warm welcome to all of you who have joined us today for this very important discussion on gender-based violence and the role of India Inc. in creating safe and inclusive workplaces. On behalf of FIKI, I'm Uma Seth, your moderator for the session. And I would like to thank uh, Ms. Aparna Mittal and the Samana Center for Gender Policy and Law for partnering with us for putting this discussion together. Uh, before I uh, begin today's panel discussion, uh, I also want to uh, acknowledge all the participants who could join us today. And uh, in case there are any questions, please put it in the chat box. And towards the end, uh, based on the time that we have, we will be able to take a few questions. Uh, before I move on to the panel discussion, um, uh, Ms. Uh, uh, Ms. Radhika Piramal, our co-chair for the DNI task force, unfortunately couldn't join us uh, last minute because of a uh, board meeting that came up at the same time. Uh, but on behalf of her and on behalf of the Vicky's task force, uh, I welcome you all. And I would also like to share that Vicky, through its task force on diversity and inclusion, uh, has been encouraging corporate India to be gender inclusive. And we have been organizing a number of awareness sessions, thematic webinars, uh, and consultations with the government, multilateral agencies, corporates, NGOs, and other stakeholders uh, on related DNI centric issues. We also help Corporate India and other organizations to build capacities of their DNI HR teams uh, towards achieving inclusion. Uh, after a highly successful uh, first batch of DEI and certification course that we had launched just last year, I'm very pleased to announce that we are doing the next batch starting from 27th of February. And uh, I would really encourage all of you to please uh, join or recommend other individuals to join. The reason being that uh, it's so important to build capacities when you're talking about inclusion uh, in organizations. Uh, and uh, a lot of corporates, uh, while they have DNI policies in place, many of them do not. Uh, so it's very important to build champions within the corporate world and other organizations to talk about inclusion internally. Uh, I also want to take this opportunity to share uh, that uh, FIKI and FIKI Ladies Organization have also initiated a mega mission last year called Empowering the Greater 50, which is launched by Honorable Ms. Priti Rani, who's the Minister of WCD. And uh, I also wanted to say uh, that the whole idea of uh, launching the Greater 50 was that how do we empower women uh, to be the best forms of themselves? And uh, the main aim is to influence the lives of at least 100,000 women by next year. And I'm happy to share that within a short span of uh, uh, six months or seven months, we have uh, at least started to reach out and reach at least 30,000 women uh, in our uh, mission. And, uh, uh, and I would really encourage all of you to join the Greater 50 as well. Uh, now, uh, before starting today's uh, program, I, of course, want, uh, just wanted to set the context about gender-based violence and how it has been... Uh, uh, seen to have a direct impact on women's workforce participation and that of sexual minorities as well. In this context, it is uh, very imperative that corporate organizations imbibe good practices to make the workplace safe and inclusive for all. Today's panel will discuss the progressive initiatives that India Inc. is implementing for preventing and redressing sexual harassment at workplace, uh, both under the provisions of the POSH Act and under their internal anti-harassment framework. I have the pleasure of welcoming and introducing our esteemed panelists who have taken out the time and joined us here today for this very important uh, discussion. Uh, Ms. Nishta Satyam, uh, who is the Deputy Country Representative at UN Women India. Uh, her role at the UN Women uh, principally focuses on developing and implementing strategies aimed at securing a diversified uh, partnership portfolio with governments and the private sector to build a community of commitment leading to sustained support for the organization, both financial and non-financial. In her current role at the UN Women, she spearheads and executes the strategy for building innovative strategic and technical partnerships and interventions in partnership with the government of India, Sri Lanka, Bhutan, and Maldives at the center and provincial levels to generate demonstrable evidence that informs, influences key policy discourses and designs. Thank you so much, Nishta, for joining us today. Uh, Ms. Aparna Mittal, who is our next panelist, is a leading equality, diversity, and inclusion advisor and a corporate lawyer with over 16 years of experience. Uh, she is the founder of Samana Center for Gender, Policy, and Law, India's leading consultancy, focused on equality and inclusion for all segments of diversity, and with a specialization on gender and LGBTQ inclusion. Prior to setting up of the uh, Samana Center, uh, she was partner with India's leading tier one corporate law firm, 
Ms. Aparna Mittal is also a member of the FIKI Task Force on D&I. Ms. Monica Piragal is the Head of Legal Risk and Corporate Governance at Lowe's India and a subsidiary of Lowe's Companies Inc., a Fortune 40 company headquartered in the US. Monica also serves as an Executive Director on the Board of Directors of Lowe's India. She has 16 years of experience in handling various aspects of legal compliance and corporate governance matters in listed and unlisted companies. Prior to Lowe's, Monica was a Vice President at Goldman Sachs Bangalore. Uh, she has worked across several industries, including consulting, telecom, financial services, IT, retail. Monica is uh, passionate about driving best practices and culture of anti-sexual harassment at workplaces. She served as a chairperson of Lowe's uh, internal committee for three years. She has investigated multiple Porsche matters, participated in various panel discussions on Porsche, hosted by Titan Industries, Bella South Asia's Ethics Summit, written articles, conducted multiple training sessions at Loves and Outside too. Uh, thank you so much, Monica, for joining. Uh, Ms. Sangeeta Rajendran, who's our next panelist, is a Senior Associate Director at KPMG India. She manages inclusion and diversity and leads Porsche for the firm. In her 14 years with KPMG, Sangeeta has worked in policies, compliance, HR, business, partnering, and global mobility. Her experience is largely in consulting and financial services industry. Uh, I would also like to acknowledge uh, the presence of our other task force members here today, uh, Ms. Monica Chip, as well as Ms. Zena Patel. Uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, so uh, with that, I would uh, really like to start uh, the discussion and I would like to start with you, Nishta, uh, on how would you contextualize gender-based violence and more specifically sexual harassment at workplace in the larger conversation on women's workforce participation. Over to you, Nista. Uh, thanks, Uma. Well, um, uh, I just realized how boring my introduction was and the need to rewrite it. So, uh, so, 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 so thank you for reading that long paragraph out that I think you, my, even my mother won't believe and I always say this. So this is my standard joke. <laughs> but uh, uh, well, I think you've, you've got some very pertinent questions uh, uh, but I think there are also some fundamental assumptions that we must uh, counter, ask ourselves. Is what do we particularly recognize as work and what do we practically, practically recognize as workplaces? You know, I think there's been a drastic shift uh, in that understanding in the post-COVID world. So when you say sexual har harassment at the workplace and when now the workplace, like I see for most of you, uh, seems like home, uh, then are we talking about a law that is relevant to us any longer? Are we talking about the need to relook at the law? Um, are we talking about how we perceive workspaces to be? And how uh, in the online world does work invade really, you know, your personal space, your private space, uh, as much as it does, uh, is, is a part of your public life as well. So let's question, so let's agree that, that we need a fundamentally different way of thinking about two things. One is what constitutes work? Because if we were to understand that a little differently, and if we were to understand that from a women's perspective, I'm reasonably sure that we could not be finding a single woman who does not work. There is a fundamental problem with how we define work, which actually uh, comes back to the issue of why we think India's labor's participation is so low, because we are measuring what we in our postmodern world understand uh, as work. So I'm going to table that uh, as, 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 as probably the base of, of, a, con of a conversation to be. Second uh, uh, is, is, you know, once you identify, once you understand workspaces and work life very differently, Laws like sexual harassment, while are, are great strides in women's lives uh, and reflect a huge part of the problem, also need a relook in the world that we live today. No one had imagined we would be working from home. No one had imagined this would be so cool. No one had imagined this would not be a productivity barrier. But bingo, here it is, and, it, and it's not. So, uh, but, you know, legally, legislatively, we are not yet ready to look at the changes that one has gone through unwillingly. Now that having, uh, have, having said that, as you and women, I think, you know, I'm glad that we're discussing these two things because, uh, you know, sexual harassment at the workplace, and it's quite surprising, uh, you know, because despite the fact that we're so progressively legislated, 
we you know we still continue to talk about harassment from the lens of the accused from the lens of the perpetrator and i think that is something that we have not been able to steer away and that applies to all forms of violence you see when we are still reporting a rape we are still reporting a girl with her hands in front clenched in shame uh, that's still the image that makes it to the newspapers uh, you know there was a there was a very questionable uh, so, uh, uh, high court not a, i think it was yeah a high court uh, judgment which said that you know abuse is only it doesn't you, abuse is abuse only if it is over clothes and you know if 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 you if you've not been undressed then it doesn't particularly qual qualify for abuse so time and again you know one is reminded that at the center of our response stands the man and the woman is still at the periphery so you know whether she feels violated even very close or not very close is not the question the fact is that someone thinks uh, it's not violation so so i think you know let us let us try and be, bring women at the center of this response there cannot be a world for women without women uh, or without asking women and i think that's a that's change number 1 uh, change number 2 is the need to question things that in the way that we knew uh, and to rethink and allow people to rethink and also organizationally come together to rethink. I have a very interesting uh, conversation lined up with Khetan because, uh, and actually one of, their, uh, one of their current partners who reached out to me is an ex-KPMG fellow from my time in KPMG. And he was the one who reached out to me saying, you know what, we're going through a fundamental change as an organization. We'd like to talk to someone who knows this. So I think we need more of those conversations. And, uh, 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 and and redefine a few things before we come really to answering your questions is, you know, how prevalent is sexual harassment in the workplace? Well, very, we know it. Uh, it has now pervaded the home space. So it's all the more, it's, it's, it's become an all pervasive uh, issue. Uh, how prevalent uh, is, uh, is women's labor force participation? Yeah, we have a way of measuring it. Let's look at work differently. And I think in the recent past, the one good thing about COVID is some of these conversations have caught fire, right? The whole world suddenly is talking about unpaid work. And I think that's how history gets made. So we're all in a point where probably history is being made. The right conversations are being, the right questions are being asked. Uh, the, the right, uh, the right, uh, the right amount of, force is coming together and even from UN women's perspective you know historically we've been talking about gender equality but if you look at you know there's a if you look at conditions uh, in, enabling conditions this is actually the first time in the history of mankind that gender equality is an actual possibility which means till today we were talking about it as ambition Uma, let me remind this to everybody that what we're talking about today is not just amb ambition and aspiration. We're talking about a live possibility. And I think that places a huge amount of burden on you, on me, to question how we think, to relearn what we know, to, to re-legislate uh, for a new world, and at the same time, open up uh, the world, both for men and women, because that workplace has to be a workplace that also respects the lives of men. You know, we've had, we've, we have a very interesting case in the, in the budget, in the, in the parliamentary session of the budget. Uh, we have the first ask of paternity leave from a, from a sitting MP uh, uh, to not attend the budget session. And I have a copy of that letter. And it's beautiful. It's beautiful because you see, this is how we're going to drive it from the top. If we keep speaking, if we don't speak of men as equal people in the household, you are never going to speak of be able to speak of women as equal stakeholders of a society. So let's free each other. But then that's a conversation that needs to happen collectively, that needs to happen organizationally. And I'm glad KP, KP, I have, a, I have love for KPMG because I come from KPMG. I spent seven years uh, of my life in KPMG. And I have to share this little story because there was at that time, the HR head of uh, KPMG was a woman called Sangeeta. Uh, two and uh, and she was very high in the ladder. But when I got a contract from the UN, it was an unstable contract. Uh, you know, it was just about a year, and I was doing very well in KPMG. I was with the CEO's office, so I went up to her and I, with great courage, you know, we used to do a, a paper called Women in the Leadership Forum. So I used to work on that. 
So uh, that's the only connection that I had to have uh, had with someone that high level. So I went up to her and I said, Sangeeta, I have an offer from the UN, but it's only for a year. So if they throw me out after a year, will KPMG take me back? And she said, we will have our arms open for you, darling. And I promise you, you will go miles from there. Uh, and one day KPMG will write to you probably to come back and you will not have to ask me that question. That response changed my life. Uh, and that woman changed my life. That organization changed my life. Uh, and, and I'm telling you, that's what we need. We can keep talking about policies and programs and you know all of that that probably never sees the light of the day, never gets to people's heart. But that response of women reaching out to women, women reaching out to men, men reaching out to women, all other ways saying, yes, go fly. We will be there for you. Don't worry about this. Uh, is the response that we need. You know, we need organizations with a heart for far too long. You know, we have glorified organizations that don't have a heart uh, and it's now become too high and dry in an environment like this. So yeah, I'm going to end my little speech. There. <laughs> thank you so much, Nishta. And thank you so much for setting that context because uh, I'm sure it was in the heads of many people that, uh, you know, now that, like you rightly said, the workplace has sort of increased, encroached our home front and uh, uh, it has dramatically uh, changed uh, even an organization like uh, FIKI, which is uh, a very old organization. And traditionally, we've always worked from office and we've not had a work from home so far. And this year, frankly, uh, you know, Corona just sort of uh, put us all at the work, you know, work from home policy suddenly just had to come. Uh, and I'm sure many organizations who didn't have that uh, earlier. And it was, a, it was a whole experimentation for the organization also about the efficacy and how well it works and it has. Uh, and speaking of which, then how does, you know, we talk about uh, uh, not just uh, harassment at workplace, but also violence and other things while working from home, because we know and we've had this conversation a lot in our DNI task force also about, you know, harassment uh, happening for not just women, but the trans community, the LGBTQ community, people with disabilities, how, you know, by staying in these uh, confined zones at home, uh, probably many of them are also cooped up with their uh, perpetrators or, you know, people, uh, they're actually uh, facing uh, their harassers uh, directly. And so how does, you know, India Inc. really uh, can, has to relook at this whole whole uh, harassment now again? Well, I'm just going to come in for a second there because sure. you're making a very, very important point. And that point is, uh, I think a principal decision by India Inc. Should India Inc. be worried about the fact that I have violence at home? You know, I think for long we have debated on whether it's our business too or it's not our business too. But for very long, businesses have also not realized that it is one of the greatest productivity barriers. You know, maternity leave is not a productivity barrier. Or going home on time is not a productivity barrier. But the constant fear of violence, I think we keep yes. talking about violence. We don't talk about the fear of violence which actually grips women almost all that time. The fear of retaliation, that fear of going home at nine o'clock and seeing, you know, uh, you know, your mother-in-law or your husband or your son, you know, make that long face about how you weren't at home. That fear, yeah. that fear, which is palpable, which is, which, which is, which is not spoken about. Uh, is it India Inc's problem? Absolutely it is because it's, it's a productivity barrier. So again, in an economy, we, while we look at individuals, you know, I think it has been convenient for organizations to look at individuals in isolation because yeah. it's too much responsibility to look at individuals as communities, but it's also very artificial yeah. because I am not an employee. I just don't work for the UN. I go back, I have a life. That life affects my life here. My life here Absolutely. affects my life there. So, you know, this entire constitution and articulation of work-life balance yeah. as if they were distinct budgets is actually made for a for a for a level of bipol bipolarity that doesn't exist uh, honestly it, it's so artificial it's it's so out of context so as employers today as co coalitions today as the un today let's make a pledge to recognize individuals as people who come from communities people who come from families people who come from contexts yeah. Yes, it is not how far do you go to solve that context? No, you don't go very far, but you go a certain distance. Yeah. It becomes your problem if you continuously stop treating it as not your problem. True, true. 
So with that, I'm going to move on to our next panelist, uh, Aparna. Uh, how is uh, addressing gender-based violence at the workplace relevant from an inclusion and diversity perspective? Uh, that would be my question to you. Great. Thank you. Very nice to meet all of you on this panel. Uh, and, you know, I just want to set, uh, you know, one part of the context which Nishtha was saying is that uh, we do have our laws which are a work in progress. But I think the point of having this open panel is that each organization, whether you're in the corporate sector or in the development sector, you can bridge a lot of that gaps through progressive policies. Uh, and the idea here is that, you know, the world is a changing landscape, but how can you use that thought leadership to create more progressive policies? Um, on your specific question, Uma, on you know the impact of gender-based violence or IND, I think any kind of uh, gender-based violence, and when I mean gender, I mean in sexual minorities as well, just in that word, I think it's completely antithetical to any kind of IND initiatives. And uh, you know, gender-based violence in itself is not just about sexual harassment. It could be workplace harassment. It could be any kind of harassment while or or whether physical or otherwise when you're working. So even aspects of domestic violence, you know, intimate partner violence, all of that come in. And internationally, if you see the conversation on GBV is going beyond sexual harassment, they're looking at all these emerging facets and seeing how can we do more. Uh, in terms of it being antithetical, I think the whole crux of DNI is that how do you leverage, uh, you know, both innovation and also having a happy, motivated, productive workforce by bringing as many diverse identities to the workplace. And any kind of sexual harassment or harassment is completely detrimental to that concept. So not only will you lose out on the benefit of IND, uh, you will actually, it's worse off, you will end up physically or psychologically harming an individual who comes to a workplace which does not have a robust framework for recognition and addressal of harassment. And I see a lot of, you know, DNI jingoism around me, pardon my calling it out. You know, everybody wants to do something, but unless you have a robust system in place, you may actually cause more harm because somebody will walk in thinking that it's all cool in this organization and I will be looked after. Uh, but what that person feels when they are harassed, it takes years for people to come forward um, and psychologically deal with the impact of, of harassment in some ways. And lastly, I think at some point, organizations both across the spectrum have to understand that this is a, a largely a goodwill and a brand issue as well. Uh, you know, we are, we are talking about millennials, we're talking about the workforce, which is deeply connected. And if you do not have a workforce or don't have an, uh, uh, an office which respects everyone, uh, especially members of the marginalized or vulnerable communities, and there is any kind of harassment which is either happening or not addressed, uh, you will just lose uh, your brand value in the long run. So I think that's where I think it's completely antithetical to any idea. Yeah, I think that's a very pertinent point about, uh, you know, uh, how it is so important uh, uh, for looking at inclusion at a very, uh, to have a very central uh, place in the organization policies and uh, uh, rightfully said, not only from a, uh, from a perspective of brand uh, or whatever else, or even connecting with the millennials, um, it is uh, so important to not just communicate uh, to the outside world, but within uh, that how this is a safe workplace for any person to come in and feel safe and uh, be the most productive that they can be. Uh, thank you so much, Aparna, for sharing that. And I would now like to move on to uh, Monica. Uh, Monica, uh, my question to you would be, uh, can you share with us some of the key facets of what the Porsche Act really requires and how does it seek to create a safe workplace for women? Over to you, Monica. Thank you, Uma, and uh, thank you for the opportunity of speaking with Sadhguru panelists. Um, talking about the question on, you know, the key facets to uh, the Porsche Act. Um, you know, after the Nirbhaya case happened, the Porsche Act was passed in 2013. And if you were to look at the statistics uh, on sexual harassment over the years in India, that's the reason why the Porsche Act was focused on protection of women at workplace. Uh, the key facets of the Porsche Act is, you know, one is, um, of course, it's about protection of women at the workplace. It has also defined what workplace is. It has defined what sexual harassment is, uh, you know, not an exhaustive definition, but to a large extent, giving us instances of what sexual harassment could be. It talks about how to, you know, address those issues and the redressal mechanism where you have to have a internal committee in the organization, which has the powers of the civil court. 
not just uh, you know uh, addressing the sexual harassment complaint but also dealing with false complaints that has also been addressed by the bosch act which is very important because you know we didn't uh, obviously the act did not intend to uh, make people misuse the entire act so false complaints is something which was very important in addressing the act um, last but not the least it, it spoke about the whole uh, time bound redress bill because you know if you were to go to the courts it can take you years and years together to you know to find a solution or to to get justice but um the posh act really uh, gave a very limited time period within which the complainant could expect the redressal and um confidentiality which is a big taboo right if you are feeling sexually harassed um you know like uh, nishta mentioned it's not about uh, the perpetrator it is about the victim and more often than not the victim feels very um, you know very embarrassed and wants to maintain confidentiality confidentiality and non retaliation i believe are the two big pillars of uh, you know sexual harassment and uh, of anti sexual harassment uh, practices which is addressed by the posh act how organizations are you know how how posh has really helped us create this whole um, you know safe workplace for women while we talk about the various facets um, you know sexual harassment is um, is perception based under the law also it says that you know it's about what the victim feels what can be a sexual harassment for me may not be sexual harassment for somebody else so it gives the liberty to the victim to say you know i feel in my perception this is sexual harassment that helps them you know uh, go to the ic which is again headed by a woman so the trust factor if the victim is a woman the trust trust factor of you know going and talking to the ic which is also headed by a woman um, makes the workplace safer uh like i said the time the time lines of you know completing the investigation within 90 days um you know the victim feels that yes they will find justice in this and they know you know to what end they have to wait to find justice the whole fear of losing a job or you know um losing their reputation just because you know they are filing the complaint or retaliation by the by the respondent all those things because it's addressed very well in the posh act i feel that you know if you look at the overall package it kind of helps us create a better and a safer workplace for women thanks monica for sharing that two three very important uh, points of course about the posh act of the fact that it is uh, you know time bound and uh, you know so the victim doesn't uh, really after uh, you know being harassed wait for years and years for a redressal and the second that it also looks at uh, you know the false complaints very seriously uh, because that is a very important uh, part uh, of course and also from the victim's perspective very rightly said that you know how i would feel about being harassed may not be the same for you so it does give the the right to the victim uh, to come forward and you know uh, talk about uh, whichever way uh, you know she is feeling harassed so these three i mean these are very important pertinent points thank you so much for sharing and with that i would now move on to sangeeta and sangeeta my question to you would be that uh, you know how are organizations uh, addressing uh, you know same sex same gender sexual harassment at workplace thank you uma and good evening everyone um so uh, you know the act per se does not address gender uh, sexual harassment complaints we all know that but if organizations make uh, their policies gender neutral i feel we can address this issue and uh, so kpmg has uh, a gender neutral anti sexual uh, harassment policy in fact all uh, our policies are gender agnostic and this is very important uh, you know to a eliminate any inadvertent uh, discrimination on the ground of gender and also you know we must extend equal up protection to all genders so uh, the need of the hr is 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 uh, gender neutral or more comprehensive sexual harassment laws uh, which is 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 you know in the waiting but some of the things that organization can do and some things that have worked for us is 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 regular uh, and focused sensitization programs you know to enable individuals to overcome their uh, inherent uh, biases and and homophobic ideas so for instance all new joiners go through a mandatory gender sensitivity training uh, where we talk about discriminatory behavior include examples of discrimination against same gender colleagues um policies of course uh, i mentioned gender neutral but also focused on zero tolerance towards discrimination and and call it out and and multiple forums very important and also explicitly calling out prevention of harassment against sexual orientation that's very important um uh, have an an lgbtq plus member on the ic panel 
um, um, our training programs have examples and questions based on LGBTQ plus related harassment or discrimination um, in our assessment section, for example. Um, like all our training programs are tuned to that. Leadership buy-in, uh, I think it, it by far it forms the core of uh, all uh, or any inclusion strategies. So that's important. Um, and I think lastly, um, forming employee resource groups. Um, I think that's that or, or the leaning groups and support groups between those who are part of the community and those who are. Uh, so I think that's that's a great way uh, to sensitize each segment to the thought process of the other. Uh, and I think that and these are some of the things that that have worked for us. And I think um, more organizations are leaning towards uh, these very, very uh, proactive steps to getting to addressing same sex, same gender, sexual harassment at workplace. Thank you so much, Sangeeta. And I think such an important point uh, being made by you about the fact that, uh, you know, uh, I think the policy also needs to slowly, hopefully we get there where we include all genders uh, in the Harassment uh, Act. And uh, very rightly, KPMG and other companies who are progressive and who included it as part of their uh, policy and have a redressal mechanism internally. Uh, and I think the other uh, point that you made about a leadership uh, sort of driving the whole thing, uh, that's how uh, the best I think it works across the entire organization and also having having the perspective of having groups and peers uh, talk to each other and should be able to rely on each other for support uh, and uh, from all groups rightly so thank you so much for all those very important points made by you and now i move on to my next question to nishtha and uh, giving you a, a very unique uh, vantage point, uh, Nishtha, as part of the UN Women, uh, what are the key challenges that you see existing in India in achieving the mandate of the Posh Act? Nishtha, over to you. Uh, Nishta, can you hear us? Uh, okay, uh, I think I will move on to Aparna and maybe take uh, Nishta's question again later. Uh, Aparna, uh, since you advise both corporate entities and organizations in the development sector, uh, what has been your experience? You know, what are the key gaps that you see that come in the way of implementation per se? Thank you. So I think a couple of things, you know, when we talk about corporate entities or entities in the development sector, I think it would be a misnomer to only think of a particular kind of companies and I, or entities there are entities and companies across the spectrum so i'm talking about the largest of the largest listed companies and the smallest of the small entrepreneurs or even uh you know uh, what we traditionally call shops and establishments because they just have three members four members six members uh, we have to in our imagination look at policies which really bring or awareness that really percolates to everyone in india inc as we call as a you know common I think couple of at a macro level, the kind of challenges I face uh, when we are trying to educate people or to push for better policies, like Sandeeta talked about, having a more comprehensive kind of framework. One is that in India, unfortunately, apart from uh, companies which are either large listed companies or are MNCs, uh, and I don't want to generalize, but that's the real focus area. All others, the, the focus on compliance is quite low. And within the basket of compliance, compliance on labor laws is even worse off. So we're looking at low hygiene, not so much focus on compliance. Then the second basket is labor laws. And within labor laws, when you talk about posh, uh, nobody cares about posh, right? And you know, uh, there are two or three broad facets. One is, of course, there is a big sense of denial. It doesn't happen, right? And most promoter-oriented organizations, and they're large organizations with 5,000 plus employees, the promoter is so proud of the organization and say, it doesn't happen at our place. So I think they come from a space of denial, which I think is a bigger issue in implementation because you refuse to see something that is all pervading uh, in some ways. And the second issue really is a very regressive myth. And thanks, Monica, for addressing uh, the whole spectrum about you know, false complaints. I think it is unbelievable that even in today's world, eight out of 10 companies I meet, they will look at me and ask me that, okay, we are happy to put in a posh implementation process or follow the law, but what will happen to false complaints? 
I mean, before you even start getting complaints, you are so, you know, there is this a fear psychosis in their minds that women are suddenly going to come forward and file lots of false complaints and get all the cool jobs they never could get in the organization. And somehow posh will become that mechanism. And I think we really have to take out all of this, you know, uh, you know regressive thinking out and really, as Monica rightly said, educate ourselves that the Posh Act is very, very focused. It has an inbuilt mechanism on false complaints. And there is just so much you can do through, you know, proper training sessions to address these myths around them. Because if you're going to be in denial or you believe that, you know, suddenly 50% of the workforce or lesser is going to just have a run with it once this act or, you know, this policy is implemented, you're never going to go into any kind of steps to implement it. And those are the really blocks in the thinking than anything else. And the third basket is because both awareness and willingness is missing, is there is no allocation of time or monetary resource. You know, I have large companies tell me, uh, do the IC training in one hour. And I'm like, I can't train the IC in one hour. You know, it takes me five hours. How do you explain so much in one hour? So, you know, it, to me, the amount of time or money and more time than money is a parameter of how much you prioritize that. So in a way, you know, pardon my saying that, but you know, it's, it's kind of being penny wise and pound foolish that you don't see the benefit, you're not aware, you don't want to educate yourself and you don't even want somebody else to do it for you. So I think that's really the challenge in implementation because once you get a credible uh, you know, advisor, whoever it may be to come and do it, it's not that complex. And you know, we have senior practitioners here from you know, Monica's and Geetha uh, on, on the call. They have implemented these processes in large organizations ranging from 3,000 of workforce to maybe 20,000 at KPMG, if I, if I have the number right. And if they can do it, then, you know, of course, it's something that's doable. You just have to open your eyes and want to do it in some way. Yeah, very true, uh, Aparna, because I think the intent uh, about wanting to spend that time and, uh, you know, getting it and I think this uh, obvious denial of uh, thinking that something like this is not uh, happening at our uh, organization. And I think the third very important point that you made is, you know, large organizations, global organizations who probably have uh, the, the policies, but it shouldn't stop there. What about the smaller organizations, like you said, even a small, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, enterprise of just maybe, uh, uh, you know, a, a shop or something establishment of just three, four employees and where, how do they look at, uh, you know, uh, a very inclusive, um, uh, inclusive and safe place for their women? Uh, you know, how are they gender inclusive? Uh, I think that is a point or that is the ultimate uh, aim or goal for us to be, uh, you know, all inclusive. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Aparna, for sharing that thought with us. And uh, I'm now going to move on to, uh, you know, uh, uh, to Monica, or, or maybe I can just uh, see if uh, Nishta is there. Nishta, are you there? Okay, that's okay. I think we'll take Nishta uh, later. Um, I, I'm going to move on to you, uh, Sangeeta. Um, uh, I just wanted to ask in your position in uh, at KPMG, uh, which has more than 20,000 employees, uh, uh, what is your approach to implementing anti-harassment, anti-sexual harassment measures? Uh, and what are the best practices uh, that you can share with uh, us, uh, the audience here? Sure. Um, there are many things, there are some things that organizations must do uh, while implementing any um, anti-sexual harassment policy. And I call them hygiene factors, like how uh, Monica and Abarna uh, covered uh, uh, you know, in, in their pieces. It's extremely important um, point. One is that, you know, have uh, procedures in place at the time to deal with discrimination and harassment. Um, our promptness in responding to the complaint. The fact that we treat every complaint seriously, and then that needs to come out in our actions and, and you know, how the process completes. Uh, have resources made available to deal with the complaint, a fully functional uh, internal uh, complaints committee comprising very senior members of the organizations taking the lead and involving themselves in, uh, you know, uh, in. Uh, this, this role to visibly demonstrate that our commitment is to provide a healthy and safe uh, work environment for all our colleagues, and especially for the person who's complained. Yeah? And lastly, how well the action taken is communicated to the person who's complained. And that is how we come full circle with this process, right? Now, I think in this whole thing, again, the most important aspect uh, is the awareness of it. You know, everyone should be aware of the existence of anti-sexual harassment policy and the process in place for resolving it, you know. Um, because otherwise, I think we're just diluting the whole uh, uh, approach to it. 
because what will happen then is that um, people may speak amongst themselves and you know decide for themselves that yes this is the right way and probably not even raise the complaint so you know making sure that it is part of all our orientation material um, uh, be it the new joiner induction program making it part of the milestone events uh, leadership forums department meetings etc wherever an outreach is possible yeah and constantly underpinning our values and all our communication which in itself is reinforcement to creating uh, a safe work culture. Second would be uh, training people, including people in position of responsibility. So all manager upward, anyone with people responsibilities on the contents of uh, you know the policy um, and, and make that an ongoing agenda. Yeah. So there are mandatory annual uh, refresher trainings which get which get refreshed every year uh, with the most topical content. Uh, for instance, last year, um, our focus uh, was largely on the entire virtual working and the nuances around uh, that in the context of sexual harassment was very topical. Um, conducting awareness sessions, um, conducting workshops for all our ICC members uh, to, to make sure that they're handling the complaints well, updating them on the POSH Act provisions, very important. Um, establishing a formal um, grievance uh, redressal mechanism, and also uh, things like you know the whistleblowing policy, the uh, the local uh, hotline, the international hotline, and also basically reflecting a very uh, robust case management system. Fourth, uh, and I think this is something a lot of organizations would do, but just reiterating that you know have very stringent IT security policies. It's a it's a very basic thing, but it's important to call that out because especially. Um, in this whole, and predominantly in the last one year, we've seen that you know internet and email can be used intentionally or otherwise as a form of sexual harassment. So any um, anything on that front is, is strictly off limits, and we've uh, reiterated that to to all our employees. Um, I've mentioned that our anti-sexual harassment policy is gender neutral. Uh, that's that's a best practice. Um, also, as we move forward. Um, <clears throat> Uh, in the virtual uh, work environment, there will be sustained efforts that we will take to create a safe space for our colleagues, uh, wherever they may be working from. And eventually, you know, looking at a, uh, at a gender balanced leadership. I think these are some of the things uh, that, that are working well for us today. Thank you so much, Sangeeta, for sharing that. And I think uh, key takeaway is absolutely that, you know, these constant conversations, both around the policy and uh, to keep the dialogue open and having constant uh, uh, dialogues, not just with our, uh, our colleagues, uh, with the leadership, speci especially, and having a balanced leadership, uh, I think, uh, is uh, some of the key takeaways that we take from you uh, about, uh, you know, implementing. Yeah. Right. And also, like, sorry, like how Monica mentioned that completion of the process within the timelines is extremely yes. important. You know, and, and yes. if you don't do that, then that kind of reflects uh, upon our, uh, you know, uh, the robustness of our case management uh, process. So, so that's yeah. very important. Yes, thanks, Sangeeta. Uh, Nishta, uh, I was just asking, uh, in fact, uh, so over to you. So the next question I was wanting to ask you, Nishta, is that, you know, given your very unique uh, vantage point as part of the UN Women, uh, what are the key challenges that you see existing in India uh, in achieving the mandate of the POSH Act? Well, honestly, uh, the key challenges in ach achieving the POSH Act is the understanding of the POSH Act. Is, 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 and, and that's true for any part of legislation, right? Because we're still going back and forth with uh, people uh, thinking, oh, this is what I said. I didn't intend it to be mm. uh, uh, sexual harassment. I just, it was just a compliment. I didn't intend it to be sexual harassment. So I think sometimes, you know, when there's an act, there's very difficult to draw away intent. There is a uh, very uh, difficult to put away, you know, you can't look at anything minus the intent and look at it in a high and dry way because that's not how it's implemented. But again, the, the principal problem in both organizations, in the messaging that organizations are giving to their employees, and I think even we're giving to each other, is about not putting the woman's perspective uh, at the center. So if, you, you know, if, if we are having a water cooler conversation to say, well, I didn't think it was uh, a sexual harassment then the real answer to that is well it doesn't matter what you think uh, if she thought it was sexual harassment and i think bringing back women to the center of the conversation as those who decide for what constitutes violation what constitutes offense 
and it not put it up to imagination or intent of the other is the first win that we need to have. Because I've been through a lot of posh training that organizations are giving, and it's about uh, uh, it, 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 it's about you know uh, it's about it's about behavior, and and usually you know sending there's this example of sending that offensive email, which you know someone sent as a joke, but a woman's finding it offensive. But even at the end of such blatantly uh, uh, direct conversations, we are not able to put the woman at the center. And I think we must even in our conversations bring it back about what it is about what the woman thinks uh, and feels violated with. It is not the prerogative of the other person on the other end. That's number one. Number two, I think uh, the, in the implementation of the act, somehow we have missed the conversation of also cultivating healthy work relationships, right? This has become a conversation in organizations about one part of the organization almost behaving hostile in caution uh, uh, with the other part of the organization. And that interrupts uh, our healthy working relationship. So as much as the conversation on Porsche is important, the conversation on healthy working relationships, respectful working relationships, relationships that are based on boundaries, because mm -hmm. we are not taught boundaries in this country very well, right? We are not taught them uh, in school we're not we, it's not a part of our grooming culture so that um, that conversation which is a more friendly conversation to have as a supplementary conversation is also a very important conversation otherwise what we're trying to build is a culture of hostility uh and then eventually it will it will it will come back to women being seen as you know oh that that danger mark uh, that uh, that men are going to stay away from. I mean, come on, really. Uh, we're not asking for anything. It's not a big ask. So so uh, you know. At, at, uh, so you know the positioning of women as that danger mark in any in in, in any uh, organization is a perception that we need to break for women to move ahead and exist, coexist peacefully and respectfully. For that, there is a different conversation that we need to have, which we're not having. Uh, the third part of the implementation of implementation is of course mindset you know we all believe in legislation we're all we all know paying taxes is a good thing do we love paying taxes are we convinced about paying taxes uh, beyond just our your duty as things to do as citizens no so i think you know we're still at a point where there is a great amount of lip sync uh, there's a great amount of lip sync even from the top without particularly believing in it. Now, I'm a great fan of lip sync because brother, you might as well feel very pressured to say the right thing than doing the wrong thing, right? So great. If you're pressurized to say the right thing, I'm so happy about the change I'm being made. So I, for a moment, don't feel bad about lip sync. But if we stop at lip sync, that 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 uh, that legislation, that act is also going to remain an act and will not convert and translate into culture. So I think where we are breaking down is the transformation, is, 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 is really that move from something being an act to being culture, right? Uh, and, and for that, people at the top uh, uh, have to adapt and adopt that piece of legislation, not as, uh, you know, like I said, not viewing women as danger marks, but really a move towards a respectful, equal society. But that, and there are many things that fall within something moving from act to culture. And that's, and time is one of them. And over some, uh, uh, you know, organizational policies, behaviors that are encouraged are another part of them. How you incentivize behavior, is a third part of them. Diversity in terms of constitution of teams is, is another part of them. And there are many ways to reach till a point. And, and it will take us time and it will take us effort and it will take us a little bit of bearing out and a little bit of hostility and a little bit of discomfort. But if we have that goal that we are trying to not just implement an act, but we are trying to build a culture eventually, I think that's what's gonna steer us through without the feeling the burden of something that is such a fair ask to make uh, of half the organization. And I think that investment in that transformation is far and few because people want to be compliant. People, uh, organizations want to be compliant to legislation. 
organizations don't want to build cultures of change. Uh, and that's going to come from the top. So everybody who's in a position of power, particularly people who are in H, and I'm, I, and I'm sorry, I don't think all culture comes from HR. I think culture comes from the top. Culture can come from everywhere. So we have to stop making uh, HR the custodians uh, uh, of something. Everybody is the custody of a work culture. And I think we need to eat, talk to CEOs as much as, as much as much as we have spoken to HR heads and to, to diversity people because we're speaking to the converted. You know, we're we're giving love to the converted. So you know, it's about the unconverted loving us back, uh, and that's when we will make that transition. Uh, where we will not talk about the implementation of Porsche as a burden, but as a rightful act of a country that moves to, needs to move forward towards an environment where you and I feel as comfortable as a him and her. Thank you so much, Nishta, for sharing that. And I think uh, that's what many of our panelists now uh, today are bringing that conversation about, you know, the leadership and how we don't just uh, look at uh, compliance, but more as a transition and as a culture at workplace uh, so that um, it, it's not uh, seen as a negative thing also from, uh, you know, doing the compliance, but more as an accepted uh, work norm also. Uh, Uma, sorry, I just want to make one more yes. point. You know, this process that we are going through when an act becomes a culture is an uncomfortable process. Yes. yes. You know, everybody is not going to be happy in this. Absolutely. So, so you, we have to stop behaving like, you know, we're ice cream vendors and everybody mm -hmm. who looks at us is going to be like, wow, what great change. Yes. No, it is going to upset people because you're challenging patriarchy. This yes. is an unpleasant process. So as people in organizations, as HR, as CEOs, as CFOs, as women, as colleagues, let us agree that change is uncomfortable. Change is unpleasant. And once we agree to that, you know, we will not be very worried uh, about who we are displeasing and who's getting upset. The yeah. one problem, even beyond corporates, the one problem about making change, particularly when it comes to gender issue, issues, is a, a, a lot of people get upset because this is about power and the redistribution of power. It doesn't please everybody. And two, those who are making the change are very worried about who they're upsetting. So, you know, if we can get rid of this burden and tell ourselves that we're making real change, we're not ice cream vendors, it's okay, people are gonna be unhappy, people are unhappy about a lot of things, might as well have this on their radar and then go through it. You know, we're also going to feel a lot less burdened about making that change. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, I just want to make one point, right? Yes. Uh, right. And uh, great, Nishta made some really great points. So. You know, just out to the audience and to the panel, uh, you know, does does these names ring a bell? Mukesh Singh, Vinay Sharma, Pavan Gupta, Akshay Thakur. These are the guys who were the perpetrators of Nirbhaya case. But we only remember the name of Nirbhaya. And the culture of change should be that the name and shame should not be with the victim. It has to go to the perpetrator. That is a big change that we have to do. I think that was a very, very significant point that you made, Monica, absolutely. In fact, uh, uh, moving on, my next uh, question uh, would be to you. Uh, you know, that in your experience as someone who leads the legal and compliance, uh, what are the key initiatives that you can share with the audience today to create more awareness? How do they have a more robust redressal system for both anti-harassment and anti-sexual harassment measures? So um, thank you, Uma, for that question. And, uh, you know, Sangeeta did touch upon a lot of things, you know, yes. she spoke about uh, trainings and stuff like that. So while I don't want to repeat that, you know, um, just, uh, just a few, uh, maybe three or four important points. Uh, while uh, the Bosch Act talks about having those periodic trainings, but this is not about checking the box, right? Yeah. Uh, organizations can choose to do that. But if you were to be, uh, you know, if you were to have progressive policies and if you want to, you know, be the change that you want to see around, um, then the key, uh, you know, initiatives uh, to drive better awareness uh, would be, you know, customize your trainings. Your audience is very different. An individual contributor versus a people manager versus your senior leadership, right? They are very different. They have very different roles. They are the flag bearers of very different uh, culture. I mean, as a leadership, you have to, you know, uh, walk the talk in a different way versus as people managers, when you are the first in line, when, you know, your employees coming and talking about sexual harassment, the way you need to deal with that is very different. So the skill sets on handling sexual harassment and the complaints and, uh, and the initial reporting, right, that has to be handled very well. 
and that is very important for us to you know uh, uh, you know customize the trainings uh, to create better awareness and to have robust redress uh, redressal systems the other thing is you know um, the whole uh, point of having these classroom trainings i mean you know they're very boring you cannot really hold the interest of a lot of people so get creative right i mean as icc you are you don't hold the ic position you know it's it's not like you know it's uh, this is something which is an entitlement it is a very very responsible position in an organization so you know as ic spend some time brainstorm and come up with some creative ways of doing things like in covid i can say that you know while people were in proximity and were in the office you could have done classroom trainings you could have done a lot of things but you know start being creative when people are not in office what are the ways because your agenda of driving awareness your agenda of still continuing to maintain a, a harassment free workplace does not dilute just because people are not in the same office so get creative do you know online theater plays do do trainings do uh, you know uh, screen savers do do all those kind of things which will you know maybe one or two statements in your screen savers which can drive a message back home that that's more than enough you don't want people to be spending like hours and hours doing all those trainings online and clicking on the right answers and you know uh, passing a quiz the idea is people for people to understand what is sexual harassment and what not to do so you know that is something which can help you create better awareness and you know uh, make your processes stronger and i will never feel tired of saying this but just train your ic also right just overdo it train your ics very basic right how do you investigate how do you ask the right questions see when you have a complainant who is you know who is weeping in front of you you have to be emotionally strong how do you ask the questions in what way do you ask the questions to get more information so train your ics on all these finer nuances the ic if they have a conflict of interest how do they recuse themselves from those investigations very important because ic is in that position where they get all the information you have to hold them more responsible for maintaining confidentiality and not you know discussing even amongst each other just as a passing comment this is not done so train your ics to do something like that because uh, you know ics are the face of your progressive policy that you as an organization believe in anti anti sexual harassment and believe in a safe workplace if your ic is not walking the talk and you have to do it every minute of your job right in your employment when i am talking here on this panel i am sending a message to my organization right what is monica speaking about what is her role at lowes does she believe in this whole thing so every minute you are actually walking the talk and that is very important training your ics customizing your trainings being creative with your trainings i think you know those are those are ways of creating better awareness thank you so much monica for sharing that absolutely i think uh, uh, instead of having endless uh, classroom discussions but having creative conversations uh, to actually drive the message back and it could be like you very rightly said suggested something as simple as having a screen saver that somebody could look at and you know uh, reiterating it kind of you imbibe uh, what the message is uh, to also uh, you know having customizing conversations because it wouldn't be uh, the same conversation for everybody right from the leadership position to like you said uh, people's manager level and third most importantly i think the ict training uh, you know you really can't overtrain them absolutely because uh ultimately they are the ones who are asking and they may not be trained counselors or psychologists to actually uh, be in a position to ask just the right question so constant hand holding and training of the ic is is a uh, very very important uh, thank you so much for sharing that with us uh, monica mm -hmm. now i'm going to move on to aparna uh, and aparna as uh, someone who advises leading organizations on creating and uh, implementing these anti harassment anti sexual harassment uh, frameworks at the workplace uh, what are some of the new initiatives that you are advising or seeing in this area Oh, thank you i think a couple of points uh, one is of course a very strong focus on bringing in a, a robust gender neutral process which i think both uh, you know sangeeta and monica have also, have also alluded to because we really need to move beyond the boundaries in fact i wouldn't say that we have to look at things uh, from the perspective of the woman i will say we have to look at things from the perspective of the victim irrespective of whether the victim is a trans person is a man or a woman and i'm not saying this just to to put out a, a some kind of jargon out there but i think it's it's equally important for the ic to be seen as neutral and not even carry inherent biases about certain genders so really we have to really move uh, in leaps and bounds in that conversation and move towards uh, gender neutral systems at the workplace 
the second focus I'm seeing a lot is that how can uh, organizations really leverage the ecosystem? So it's not just about compliance and awareness and uh, redressal mechanisms at your organization. What can you do to uh, influence a larger ecosystem? Your vendors, your suppliers, your subsidiaries, your investing companies. If you're in the nonprofit sector, people you're giving uh, funding grants to. How can you really create that cascading effect? Uh, and you know there are various mechanisms. You know we can go on endlessly about how you can do that. You know whether you do it through contractual provisions, you put conditionalities, you tighten your RFP uh, provisions to make sure that some information comes back to you. Uh, I know that a lot of you know global uh, investors and funding institutions are talking about blacklisting. That if you know if you we will give you a time to clean up, we will give you a time to reform. But if you're having repeated sexual harassment complaints at your organization in spite of two three years of training and system building, you know you're not going to get this RFP from us. You know, so really really you know strengthen the processes across the ecosystem. Um, uh, make sure that you are looking at you know stronger reps or ESG compliances. So it is irrespective of the kind of commercial or business transaction that you're doing. And this equally applies to the nonprofit sector because one thing I think is the nonprofit sector may not be making profits, but they are still doing business. They're still doing operations. They're still engaging with vendors. So this really cuts across all organizations. Uh, and a couple of final points is I think the our understanding of gender-based violence. Uh, if you look at what the ILO is doing and what international organizations are doing, they are going beyond purely talking about sexual harassment. So you're not know, talking about child sexual abuse. How can you have child safeguarding policies? Uh, so many organizations interface with children uh, through their work. How do you bring that in? Uh, what are you doing on domestic violence? And I think, Nishtha, you opened the conversation with the overlap of work and home and how long can we close our eyes to what is so unfortunately in our face and how can you really create that thought leadership? And also uh, cultivating allies and bystanders. You know, bystander intervention is so important. You're working at home, you know something's happening at your neighbor's place. How long are you going to ignore it? So how do you train people to say, look, it's safe for you to step up. You know, these are the things you can do so that you don't compromise on your safety, but yet get help for somebody who's probably locked inside the house and facing something even worse uh, than just listening to what you are hearing as a neighbor. And lastly, I think, uh, uh, I personally think, and I think, Uma, you know, you, you, you resonate with this, is CSR is not just about money. You know, when we talk about corporate social responsibility, it's not about writing that check. It's not about whether I qualify under the Companies Act to have to invest. CSR, to my mind, is about thought leadership. You know, how can you really evolve, learn, uh, and take those learnings to everybody in your ecosystem? Because if each company or organization picks 10 people they want to influence, I think it will make our collective job a lot more easier. Uh, and I think that's really the hope uh, which, I, which I carry forward through these conversations. Thank you so much, Aparna, uh, for uh, sharing, uh, you know, uh, all of your thoughts and uh, very important and very pertinent also from the point of view that it's not just India Inc. or corporates, but uh, all organizations, big or small, uh, to have this conversation and very important. Uh, and I totally, uh, you know, that has been the focus of our task force also uh, to be gender neutral when you're having all these conversations, to be more inclusive, to be uh, all gender inclusive. Uh, and and uh, the, the supply chains or the vendors that you're talking about, I think that is one great point uh, about the fact that uh, in case you're not very inclusive or even looking at it or there are some very serious charges against a particular supplier or a vendor or, uh, you know, so they do not qualify. I think these are some of the measures that all of us can take uh, to make sure that the conversation and lastly, of course, uh, the CSR that every time uh, you're implementing a project on ground, how do we also carry, uh, you know, conversations about uh, uh, harassment or inclusion in, in uh, all of our projects wherever we are implementing. So thank you so much for making these very, very important points of Parna. And now I'm going to move on to uh, Sangeeta. Um, so uh, Sangeeta, is there a way workplaces can address the larger <coughs> gamut of gender-based violence, uh, which goes beyond sexual harassment, like uh, you know, domestic or intimate partner violence. Uh, do you think we can uh, also address that? Yeah, thanks, Ava. Um, I think I think we can. I think organizations can. Um, it's it's a question of getting um, some of these things together, um, and and then look at a focused approach. So, um, you know, we don't have um, 
uh, a policy or a, or, a, or a domestic violence program yet, but, but we're working on it, we're developing it. But what uh, led us to this was that, you know, we ran a survey last year during COVID, and this was a well-being survey that we did uh, for our women uh, colleagues. So we have something called, uh, and, and Nishna would remember, <laughs> a KPMG network of women, uh, which is an all, so all women in KPMG form part of this network. So we wanted to, and, and the, the reason for the survey was the, 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 the thought that most caregiving responsibilities rest with women, and therefore the survey. So the survey made a segue into a couple of uh, other interventions, and one of them was, was, was this. So um, I think, uh, so, so two things. Um, it required some amount of uh, introspection to understand the resources and policy framework an organization currently has in place, right? And, and from there, we start on. So, for instance, uh, first first thing is, you know, defining boundaries of participation. So, you know, you support, but without being intrusive, because it's a very personal matter. And as a person comes up, uh, comes to you and, you know, talks about it, we'll come to that in a bit. Secondly, uh, you know, what kind of access to resources um, uh, are available, monetary, uh, uh, you know, um, support helplines, legal, etc.? A um, large part of it depends upon the empathy quotient, you know, the understanding of, of, of the entire uh, uh, gamut of uh, domestic violence. Um, what are some of the things that an organization can offer, for example, flexible working arrangements, uh, pragmatic approach to uh, performance for that period of absence, et cetera. So, um, so these are some of the thoughts that came into our, uh, to our minds. And some of the things that you know, organizations could look at is firstly breaking the stigma around uh, domestic violence. So, one of the things is that we don't talk about domestic violence and, and just like we don't talk about mental health, you know, so it's, it's a taboo. It's a subject that not many people talk about. So it's very important for our organizations to break that taboo in acknowledging that such things do happen. Employees may be going through something uh, of this sort and, and that becomes significantly relevant during the lockdown period. And that's when it kind of came up uh, like, a, like, a, like so uh, evidently Secondly, um, you know, publishing information about helplines um, and leveraging the existing, um, uh, you know, uh, employee uh, counseling network, whatever resources we have, and then build on it, right? Um, it is important to understand that, you know, not everybody is trained to address these issues. So bring in an external uh, help. So education and sensitizing, like all aspects of diversity and inclusion, basically building a greater uh, understanding uh, of this concept is key to building a safe space for employees, basically, you know, especially to report domestic violence. So for example, sensitizing leadership, sensitizing managers, and everybody involved in that chain is particularly important. And, and for example, someone comes to you and says, you know, someone wants to report uh, domestic violence. Uh, what does the manager do? How does the manager respond? And how, do, how does one identify symptoms? Are there symptoms, first of all? And how do you differentiate those? And what is the connection between mm -hmm. aggression at work uh, and uh, domestic violence. So these things. Then, uh, you know, reasonable accommodation, um, for example, you know, if, if there is, again, this is very personal, domestic violence is very, very personal to somebody's life. And so it's a call that they need to take as to how they want to uh, take that reasonable accommodation. So one of the best practices is to have um, a, a safety leave, for example. And lastly, and I think we've talked about this over and over again, even domestic violence program should be inclusive because any person with an identity can experience domestic violence. So these are some of the things that I could think of, uh, you know, while developing uh, a domestic violence program. Thank you so much, Sangeeta. And I think uh, very important that uh, just beginning a conversation uh, and removing the stigma is, I think, the first step uh, to even, uh, uh, you know, have our colleagues uh, feel comfortable enough to come and speak about it and then think about what is it that they can do or how can the uh, you know organization help in any which way and of course violence uh, to all genders i mean not just uh, women uh, uh, you know to be gender neutral even there is something that i think organizations need to think about uh, very rightly so thanks sangeeta and i would now move to monica uh, monica would you like to just uh, supplement uh, what sangeeta said and especially with the lines between work and home getting so blurred now are the corporates really aware or prepared to address these aspects and what more can they do sure thank you Uma. so uh, you know there's this concept of uh, shadow pandemic right 
so while pandemic is happening and everyone is aware of covid you know that is the most used word in the world in 2020 right um it took us off guard um covid took us off guard working from home uh, you know permanently took us off guard organization were still grappling with the whole idea of how to work from home how to manage you know your business continuity how to you know uh, ensure that your network you know is up there and you know you are still connected with your stakeholders frankly uh, you know preventing and uh, preventing sexual harassment was not on top of anybody's mind because you know there were bigger problems to deal with so what happened when when you know people were not thinking of this right because your entire setup changed so uh, the exposure the instances of harassment would also change right because people were also exposed to a different uh, you know uh, setup back home uh, domestic violence went up your harassment complaints went up uh, your rape and uh, you know sexual uh, assault kind of cases came down uh that's because of the lockdown and you know people were not uh, people's movement was restricted but when you see this whole statistics which was issued by the ncw which talks about you know your domestic violence cyber cyber crime and your sexual harassment related complaints going up this is a shadow pandemic it is a pandemic under a pandemic right and are organizations aware of it when it started i would say no because nobody thought of it right that was not on top of everybody's mind but yes as you know people started settling to work from home and when we you know all organizations started seeing the trend that the complaint though the proximity of employees is not there people are sitting in their respective houses or you know different workplaces but still there is sexual harassment there is the online sexual harassment there are different forms of sexual harassment yes at that point i think you know corporate started to wake up to the whole idea that you know this is not a problem which has gone just because human beings are not with each other it can happen in any form or shape yeah. and um what have organizations done to address this kind of issue uh, i would say you know uh, march april may when there was a lockdown not much was done and that is why we saw a spike and you know people didn't know how to handle this but um, there were various webinars there are there are sessions like what fiki is doing now so there is a lot of opportunity for you know people to hear what other organizations are doing um you know learn from other other organizations learn the best practices and implement that um and i also must you know give the credit to uh, hr who is also who also brought that whole employee wellness to the center right in covid because of work life balance and all the other issues like right? depression and people not um, you know being too stressed working from home with so many other responsibilities hr did bring the whole employee wellness to the center which again you know helped ic uh, the internal committee uh, agenda was definitely pushed further to say that you know while hr is talking about other employee wellness initiatives we can also address the whole sexual harassment aspect in the same breath so uh, our external advisors who are in the markets you know like um, samana like aparna mittal is doing a great job on this and there are many others as well you know seek out for information seek out for uh, you know inputs you know, there's no harm in uh, learning from each other and see what works for your organization and implement that i can probably say that at lose we did that we saw what what worked for us at what point in time what was our audience target audience like and we implemented those so um yes when we when we when we look back one year i think we have come a long way uh, we also ensured that you know policies were relooked at right Uh, a regular workplace harassment policy uh, a regular anti sexual harassment policy the definition of workplace was very limited because to everybody's mind workplace was the office premises where we came and went back but now you know your houses are seeping into your work your work is getting exposed to your you know how so there is there is so much of uh, you know there there is no line between the two so um, we also have to kind of be more creative in addressing those issues Sure. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Monica, for sharing that. Absolutely, I think when the pandemic started, nobody thought uh, so much, uh, you know. And in fact, suddenly even mental health became a very central conversation, and so many organizations I saw were having internal, external, uh, uh, you know, uh, what you call conversations, uh, and uh, it it became a central topic. And emotional well-being, like you rightly said, and similarly, I think sexual harassment, uh, you know, how does it uh, define when you're talking about working from home and companies are looking at it these are uh, i think few conversations with uh, uh, intentionally or unintentionally came center stage and at least people were taking notice and talking you know and you're right i think companies or organizations can 
help each other and uh, you know um, uh, can really learn from each other i think that is very important uh, and on that note i think we have come to a close of our uh, panel and uh, nishtha i think has to leave uh, because of another discussion we have of course over overdone our uh, time limit uh, uh, so uh, i think i could very quickly just ask uh, if uh, you know uh, nishtha if i may put the last question to you i know you have to leave i love captive audiences i want to say that yeah so nishtha just uh, you know globally uh, what do you think are the emerging focus areas uh, uh, there in uh, this uh, you know what what can india do more to mitigate gender based violence at workplace you know what are the global uh, learnings well honestly i think it's very difficult to apply global learnings to the work culture in india because we are so different uh, in we are so unique you know we are so socio culturally rooted that we carry back uh as our, our, our culture from our homes really to 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 our workplaces and and that would be probably my greatest uh, takeaway is that i think it's enough i think it there is time to stop importing global best practices to india because we are so unique in what we are taught in how we are groomed our patriarchy is different their patriarchy is different uh and i think we have socio cultural biases uh we have very different homes you know uh, and we have very different uh, uh network of relationships so to just import a best practice and um, and apply it here uh you know may may not particularly see that resonance because our problems are different we understand different language so that's number one uh glo globally i think there is a there is a there is a there is a louder clarion call for this to be a, a key organizational uh, you know a key organizational burden not a frill burden and i think that's what we must import import to the country that you know let's not wait for ourselves to evolve until this becomes the issue uh, that we want to talk about and not treat it really to the frivolousness with the light handedness uh uh that we currently do and with the seriousness that it does but we're so uniquely placed uh you know honestly this is my learning uh that uh, uh things like flexible work work uh, you know work timings i think we've picked it up we've picked it up because everybody's doing it uh um, and you know when i have a conversation with women it's i'm not saying that everybody's doing the wrong thing i'm just i'm just trying to give you my insight when i speak to women women actually say that you know i'm not too sure if i want flexibility i actually want routine because my daughter has a class every 9 o'clock every wednesday so if i can be not flexible but have a late wednesday and fix it uh that's probably more useful to me i think when we look at life cycle we look at it the way it happens in the west where motherhood uh, is really the only thing that that draws away time from women but here in india the very institution of marriage is also where women translate from being career seekers to job seekers Uh, and we don't uh, we don't address this issue with them when they're making that transition we actually as organizations address this issue with them when they've gone too far you know they're all, they've already uh, they've already accepted for themselves that they're not going to have a career they're going to have a job um, and and so you know the we have to adopt a life cycle approach and a unique life life cycle approach because for us marriage is a point of change is a pivot motherhood is a pivot care of the elderly is a pivot uh, uh time uh, you know being there on time has a different social connotation from how it is in the west so we need a life cycle approach we don't need a just a flexible approach and that's where i think you know we must stand up and say you know what our challenges are unique our solutions have to be unique uh, our, our challenges are complex our solutions have to be complex uh and 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 i think that's a fundamental departure from uh from looking outwards to looking inwards uh, and i think organizations must make it uh, uh sooner than later because we have to talk to people in languages that they understand so i have it answered your question and i've overspoken but but i do want us to think differently so sorry 
Thank you so much, Mr. for sharing uh, sharing that uh, wonderfully. And uh, with that point, we've come to a close. Uh, in case there are any questions uh, quickly, maybe a couple of them we can take if, uh, if the participants want to put in the chat box. Or alternatively, uh, please reach out to Fiki uh, or any of our panelists. Uh, we would be happy to take them and get back to you on mail. Uh, so I think just a couple of minutes to our audience in case they want to put anything in the chat box here. Okay, I don't see any on the chat box. So we'll take it later in case audience wants to reach out to us. Uh, with that, we come to a close of this very important uh, webinar and uh, uh, we've really, I'm really, really thankful to all of you are, uh, very esteemed panelists, uh, Aparna and Sangeeta, Nishtha and Monica. Thank you so much for giving us time and, uh, you know, addressing uh, this very important conversation. And this is a conversation, I think, which needs to be continuously made, repeatedly made. Uh, and I think uh, this, is, uh, this is not something that, uh, you know, uh, all of us need to continuously have. And the more conversations we have, probably uh, we could have uh, some trickle effect and hopefully... Uh, make very many more policy changes and be more inclusive. So on that note, uh, thank you so much, all of you, for joining us today. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Good evening, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.